let's uh, reconvene. Thanks a lot for coming back. I see the donut supply is depleted, so that's good. I won't have to apply those directly to my hips and thighs tomorrow. Uh, okay, so the good news uh, about living in California is that we are at the forefront of regulation in, in all areas, in particular cybersecurity and privacy. The bad news about living in California is that we're at the forefront of regulation of cybersecurity and privacy. As you probably know, last year in June, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act became law. Uh, it will take effect uh, January 1st, 2020, along with a separate law, the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act. Uh, the CCPA, the privacy law, is uh, by some accounts uh, long and vague and hard to enforce, and the IoT law is short and vague and hard to enforce. <coughs> uh, but they are working on regulations, and we've got a great panel of people to talk about it, uh, starting with uh, Jack Lerner. Jack is the clinical professor of law here at UCI. Uh, he studies problems at the intersection of law and technology. He's also the director of the UCI Intellectual Property Arts and Technology Clinic. So. If any of you have movie script ideas, Jack's the guy to talk to. Um, law students in that clinic counsel and represent policymakers, artists, innovators, nonprofit organizations, and others on a range of IP and technology issues. Jack has written and spoken widely on privacy and technology law, and in 2016, he was named uh, Attorney of the Year by California Lawyer Magazine. He's also Executive Editor of Internet Law and Practice in California. And also, I know from prior conferences and our discussions, has a passion and an expertise in election law security. So, without further ado, Jack Lerner. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Brian, for putting this, this together. Very interesting. I love the interdisciplinary aspect of this as well. So, what I'm going to do is just present a very short overview of the regulatory environment, uh, also known as chaos. Um, <laughs> Uh, as regards the Internet of Things. All right. So the first thing to think about is the Internet of Things, even if you leave the legal environment out, or the legal challenges out, is adds a, a huge layer of complexity to any company or anyone trying to uh, design or create in, uh, products that are going to be part of the Internet of Things. Right? Because you're going from physical, physical function, you're going from a toaster oven to a data collection device where that data can be processed, uh, uh, employed in various ways, deployed in various ways, or monetized, right? Uh, so you have technical challenges you didn't have before. You know, the toaster maker now has to think about digital security, has to think about storage, has to think about processing. Uh, uh, there, that, that also has management and organizational challenges. You know, you have to have a privacy department, you have to have a bunch more technical people. Uh, and, of course, a very complex legal department, right? So. Uh, there are tons of laws. We'll talk about some of them today. Uh, there are 50 sta uh, U.S. state jurisdictions. There are, is also federal jurisdiction. Uh, and then there's international, right? And so we have the European Union, uh, which just went where the uh, general data protection regulation just went into effect. And then you have European Union member states, which are implementing the GDPR <coughs> as we speak. Uh, a lot of these laws are vague. It's uncertain how to interpret them. And that's why lawyers get paid $500 an hour or whatever it is because they have to navigate uncertain waters or help you do so uh, or help companies do so. Um, and of course, it's rapidly changing, right? So we talked already, we mentioned the California Consumer Privacy Act, which in some ways is it, certainly a landmark act. In some ways, it is, it's probably the most aggressive general privacy law in the country. Um, it's also widely seen both by industry and by consumer advocates and, uh, um, and public advocates as a deeply flawed law. The, the way that was, what happened was a very wealthy individual decided that privacy was very important and put on the ballot what became the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, in other words, he funded a petition drive and, and spent, you know, I think seven or eight figures getting enough signatures to have an initiative, which is going to be on the 2018 ballot uh, statewide, and was virtually certain to pass because <coughs> consumer privacy is very important to consumers. Uh, the state legislature said, wow, that's, that's pretty intense, and the problem is that it's very hard to amend an initiative. So 
they passed the Consumer Privacy Act <coughs> in record time. I think it was like, I mean, it was it was like a tenth of how long that law would take to be vetted, <coughs> approved, and 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 designed. Uh, it was all done very very rapidly in order to get it passed and signed before it was too late to take it off of the ballot for for, uh, for a statewide initiative. This all happened in 2018. Um, so now we have some efforts to approve it, which one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Jordan, will talk about. But first, I just want to give this. So that's a little bit of the context. Um, rapidly changing. We don't know how the CCPA is going to be uh, implemented. We don't know how it's going to change. It's very likely to be amended at some point. Um, leaving the CCPA aside, right? we have many different unique legal challenges to the Internet of Things. First of all, you have to worry about security. We've talked a lot about security today. That's not just a privacy issue. You, there are lots of privacy laws you could violate if you, if you ha don't have a secure product. And as we know, many products, a, a huge proportion, if not the majority of products, have very faulty security. People have not even been thinking about security. But that's not just a privacy issue. It can be a products liability issue. Um, it can, it, you could be violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act or the Fair Housing Act or things that aren't necessarily thought to have to do with privacy law. Um, which is why being an internet lawyer has always been fun because it's a very, it's a general discipline, you know. We have to think about basic jurisdictional questions that people learn in the first week of law school and we have to think about, you know, cutting edge uh, privacy statutes like the CCPA. Discrimination. Uh, this is a problem generally with machine learning and AI. Uh, uh, you can take biases that are, uh, that, that are implicit or explicit in the way that the in, in the way that uh, data is collected and those biases can be imported into into the technology and used to discriminate right and we've got lots of examples uh, of that already obviously you have to think about consumer privacy and all the laws and then there's a question of consent um, and, cons and are you are you uh, actually the agreement that you've reached with consumers is that uh, has the agreement that you reach with consumers actually been met? Are you honoring those terms, right? One thing to understand about privacy, and this is, this is one of the biggest takeaways for anybody who's thinking about privacy law and the Internet of Things, and that is there is no one overarching privacy law. The CCPA is the closest thing there is, um, and that, 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 of course, only covers California. It's not a federal law, right? There is no federal law. What there are, what there is, is an overlapping set of different regimes in privacy law that cover what you might consider privacy. So statutory, that means laws that Congress or state legislatures pass, right? The California Consumer Privacy Act, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, a federal law that says you can't intercept uh, somebody's communications without their consent, you can't turn stuff over to the government without a warrant, lots of other things uh, that covers anyone handling data in transmission or in storage. COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. You need to get parental consent via a specific kind of consent for, uh, for anyone under 13, which is why uh, you can have your, any, anyone who's under 13 can actually have their Gmail account, their Facebook account, their Twitter account taken away at a moment's notice, or without any notice, because Twitter and Google and Facebook and all these other companies don't want to deal with the kind of consent that's required for COPA. So what do they do? They just say, 13-year-old, anyone under 13 is not allowed to use the service. Um, regulatory regime, right? So the, the, again, you know, if there's a if there's some, if there's an overarching regulatory regime, it's the it's the Federal Trade Commission's authority to regulate, and there's a whole body of law based on how the FTC has decided to enforce. But that's <coughs> one agency covering. A huge, huge swath, and as you've seen, you know we have a five billion dollar uh, fine against Facebook, which is something like ten percent of revenue. That's actually a really, really, really big fine. But that's a fine for breaking a settlement. The FTC went after the went after Facebook ten years ago and said, "Look at all these laws you're breaking, and you're including the federal uh, law, the law prohibiting unfair trade practices." Um, we they entered into a settlement that was going to last 20 years. Facebook ended up breaking that in multiple ways, and so they're, they're about to get fined. The, the term people are throwing around is $5 billion. Tort, 
Tort law is a legally recognized wrong. If I hit someone, I've committed battery, and I can get sued for that, and people can get sued for uh, various torts, and these go back sometimes hundreds of years. Contract law we talked about, and then, um, of course, the general data protection regulation. I, I have upcoming because it's being implemented by EU countries. Talking about statutes, this is just a smattering of the literally hundreds of privacy statutes that are out there. Uh, a few years ago, I was part of a state bar, I was the chair of the state bar uh, committee on internet law, and we looked at, or cyber law rather, and we looked at uh, legislative activity in California around the country. And in state legislatures, there are hundreds of bills introduced every single session all over the country. Uh, so it's complicated. I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about the California Consumer Privacy Act so that you know where it is now, what it does generally, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, the, rest of, the rest of the time. So who does it cover? Uh, companies, okay, 25 million annual gross revenue is great. Facebook's going to be covered, but luckily the little startup is not. But wait a minute, do you have the information of at least 50,000 California consumers? That's not very difficult to come up with, or households or devices. Or do you derive 50% or more of your revenues from personal information? And if so, uh, you're covered by the CCPA. What does it require? First of all, you have to show your customers what you have on them. There's already a law that does this a little bit in California, but this, is, this one has more teeth. Uh, you have to uh, tell the consumers what you're collecting. Right now, that's not necessarily known. Uh, in particular, algorithms are, are very complex. Many privacy policies, and for me as, a, as someone who works on behalf of consumer companies, to my chagrin, many privacy policies just say we may share your information with our partners. Well, what does that mean? Who are your partners? Who are you sharing it with, right? And of course, you don't know, and if you want to use a product, you have to sign it. Uh, deletion, right? And this is kind of similar in Europe, they call it the right to be forgotten. You can say, hey, Facebook, delete all the stuff that you have or whoever, it doesn't have to be Facebook, obviously. Anti-discrimination, so if you say, hey, no, I want you to, to delete my stuff, I want to opt out uh, from, from, uh, from your data collection, you can't then turn around and say, okay, you know what, get off my platform, right? <coughs> so the, the idea is that most consumers won't opt out, but some will, and those companies are still gonna have to do business with those consumers that opt out. And finally, they have to have an online privacy policy, which was already in the law. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. We can talk about the GDPR as well, but that's a lot more complicated and we probably don't have time if we want to get to some of the interesting IoT-related issues. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Jack. I, I refuse to be the lawyer in the room who is out gloomed and doomed by someone else. So in addition to Jack's eye chart of laws, yeah. I just want to point out there's a lot of sneaky potential legal liability out there too. So earlier we were talking about these denial of service attacks where attackers take over hundreds, thousands, millions of devices, use those devices to attack others. Uh, there's a famous case a few years ago where companies put a uh, video chip infected with malware in a lot of television sets and things like that. Those devices were used to launch attacks. Nobody got sued over that probably, be, or not successfully at least, probably because there was a feeling that nobody necessarily should have expected that. But now, if that happens again, if you're a company that manufactures or sells or assembles a device in the United States and you put in an infected uh, component and you knew or should have known it's infected, I think there's a high likelihood that there will be very serious lawsuits over that. And why am I confident in predicting that? Because I've had plaintiff's lawyers call me and ask me if I want to be an expert witness in those lawsuits, <laughs> which I'm not going to do, but that's a little bit of intelligence. So um, with that additional gloom and doom, I want to introduce uh, our colleague, Scott Jordan. He's a professor of computer science here at UCI. Uh, his research is focused on internet quality of service issues, including traffic management and resource allocation in both wired and wireless networks. Current research interests are internet policy issues, including net neutrality and privacy. In 2006, uh, Scott served as an IEEE Congressional Fellow in the United States Senate, and from 2014 to 2016, Scott served as the Chief Technologist at the Federal Communications Commission, advising on a range of technological issues, 
including the open internet and broadband privacy orders. And uh, I'm happy to say Scott also is uh, working with our institute on a significant uh, research project based on a gift that we received. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But and meanwhile, to help us try to sort these things out, Scott Jordan. So I'm, I'm not going to be nearly as gloom and doom as the rest of the panelists. Um, so what I want to do, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes giving you a little bit more depth on um, what's in the California law. And then I suspect on the questions and discussion afterwards, we can dive in kind of wherever you want to go on where's that law going or what recommendations do folks have to change. OK, so California law. The idea, most of privacy law to date People are arguing over the right approach for the future, but most of it is based on the lingo is notice and consent. The notice part is that you should be able to understand what companies are doing with your data, and the consent part is you should have choice. So what does the California law do? So it starts with you should have the right to know what kinds of data companies collect about you. So it says that in the privacy policies, which have a tremendous need to be improved, um, they will need to disclose the categories of personal information that they collect. You know, for instance, and your internet service provider would say, you know, do we collect the places you go on the internet? Do we collect the location of your smartphone? Things like that. And they'll be required to talk about the purposes. <coughs> Are they collecting it just to operate the service that you want them to do, like getting you across the internet? Or are they also collecting it for other uses, like monetizing it for advertising purposes? So that's just all about collection. The second part of it is about sharing. Um, are they sharing it with some other business or third party for other than the purpose of offering the service that you signed up for? And if so, they'll be required to tell you about similar kind of thing. What categories of information do they share? and categories of businesses. No, not specific lists of businesses, but categories of businesses. That's where they drew the line. And the third thing is they recognize that businesses often outsource information to another company in order to do some task that's part of operating the service. And in that case, the idea is that's different than if it's being handed off to another party for something other than the purpose but there's a similar treatment. Um, in many ways, the California law is similar to the European law, which is called GDPR. In some ways, it's not. And disclosure, it's roughly similar. It's kind of, they roughly drew the lines in the same place. OK, so all of that should go into making much better privacy policies than those god-awful long things that you see today. We'll sure come back to that in discussion. The second part of it is it's not just that you should have the right to know what companies collect and what they do with it share it with, you should have some right to make choices. So the general theory goes there's three buckets. There's information that a company needs to collect and use in order to give you the service or the app that you signed up for. In that case, you consent when you agree to the terms and conditions of the service. And the California law takes the same approach defines a category called business purposes and says, if it's to implement the thing you asked for, you agree to <coughs> sign up. You can't withdraw consent without stopping to use the product because we wouldn't be able to offer the product anymore. The other two buckets have to do with when it's not for the purposes of the service you signed up for, is the default either the company can use it unless you tell them not to, or is the default the company can't use it until you give permission to it. And what the California law did is it said, for minors, we're going to make it the second, the more protect, protective one. You have to give consent on behalf of your kids before the company can do it. But for adults, the other way around. Companies can do it unless you tell them not to do it. Um, that opt-out consent, your ability to say, I don't want you to share my information for purposes other than the service I signed up for, is the one that gets a lot of attention and a lot of argument. Um, two other pieces, briefly. So one is down in the weeds, there's a big argument that I'm sure we'll talk about as it goes on 
about what about information that companies claim is anonymized or de-identified. And policy options are all over the board and how to deal with that. Um, the California law put in a fairly tightly controlled definition of what de-identified or anonymized mean that isn't necessarily in agreement with what a lot of claims are on privacy policies about something that's been de-identified. Folks who are interested will dig into that. But if it fits this category, um, then the stuff I said about choice doesn't apply. And then the last part, um, which Jack briefly mentioned, was that under the law, you will have a right <laughs> to go to a company that has collected your information. They will have already in the privacy policy said the kinds of things they collect. If you go to them and prove that you're you, then you will be able to get the specific pieces of information that they've collected about you. And you'll have a right to ask them to delete that information unless they still need it to provide the service you asked them to provide or a couple of other categories, security, debugging, research, so that researchers have some access. So that's a big picture of it. Um, we'll drive the conversation kind of wherever you want about where it goes from here. But just as a big landscape, the Attorney General's office is responsible this year for figuring out how to implement. It's supposed to kick in January 1 of next year. Um, in parallel, as was mentioned, there's a number of attempts to both strengthen it and to weaken it or change it. Um, and we'll see where those go over the next couple of months. And then finally, Congress is feeling the fire to at least make it look like they're doing something. Um, both parties agree. And so we're waiting to see if Congress can do anything bipartisan. Um, one of the reasons that they have some motivation is some folks don't want something as strong as California's law. And they think if they can pass a weaker version in DC, that it may preempt California's law. <coughs> and so that's all waiting to be seen by that place. Anyway, look forward to the discussion and to your questions. Thank you, Scott. And next up to help us set the stage is Athena Markupulu. She's Associate Professor in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and a Chancellor's Fellow here at UCI and the Director of the Network Systems Programs here. Not anymore. Not anymore? <laughs> okay. Uh, should have deleted that. Uh, she, I hope, still has a master's degree and PhD in electrical engineering <laughs> from Stanford, uh, received the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Sam Welly School of Engineering Faculty Mid-Career Award for Research, and the OCEC Educator Award. So, Athena, please yes. share with us. Okay. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Um, my interest is more the technology side of things, so what are the problems or the solutions we develop to deal with security and privacy. Uh, but just to start the discussion, I just want to um, uh, uh, describe three examples where the technical solutions are there, um, but things go wrong because the law, the law is not there yet. So the first example is the, the Mirai attack that you mentioned in your opening uh, um, talk which was a big denial of service attack that was launched back in 2016 from a number of uh, security cameras, uh, for a, from a large number of security cameras. And the way those cameras were compromised were very simple. They were, uh, the attackers just scanned open ports and they tried default passwords and with a combination of, in the order of 60, a uh, combination of credentials, they were able to log in to, um, uh, I forget the number, but it's like in the order of uh, a billion of devices or, uh, and um, they launched a very successful kind of sales attack. So there the technology was there. It was just that nobody was responsible to come back to your liability comment to uh, take responsibility for applying those reasonable practices, which would be don't use default passwords and um, don't let your network being scanned from outside. So um, this is the place where technology is there and the law is coming there. Uh, I believe that part of CCPA says that companies that uh, uh, and manufacturers should apply reasonable practices. In that case, that would be a reasonable practice. That has to be a vague term because what a reasonable practice is evolves over time. So that's one example. Uh, the second example is with home assistance that uh, some people already discussed. Uh, um, uh, Amazon Echo, I believe. So Amazon Echo or uh, Google Mini or all these uh, home assistants that have the microphones always on. 
Um, the technical solutions are there. Uh, we are supposed to have uh, to only invoke recording when we have the wake word, the uh, OK Google, or um, or whatever. Um, there are cases. Uh, so, and I think that's, in that's interesting, where these devices have been used as evidence in uh, law enforcement cases. So there was a case in, with a murder in Arkansas, which was a, uh, wh where the law enforcement wanted to get the records of ECHO to, um, um, <coughs> to figure out what's going on. Uh, but Amazon was refusing to do that. Eventually, they ended up using smart water meters as uh, evidence because it was a bathtub murder and so on. So the, the interesting thing is the, the technical uh, pieces are there. Um, there was a legal contradiction in that case. Uh, there was a contradiction between the privacy of the home and uh, the, the third party doctrine. So um, those devices are used in their home, which is supposed to be private, and uh, most law is, is, is okay with that, that we should protect the privacy of the home. On the other hand, our data from the home get recorded and uploaded in third party servers. So are, are these records, are the uh, um, um, Amazon Echo records similar to <coughs> our telephone records or our bank records that uh, law enforcement uh, can uh, have access without a warrant or no? So that's where the law has currently contradiction. Um, and the IoT are right in the middle of that. They are private because they are on our body or in our home, but they are also operated and recorded by third party um, uh, service providers. And um, the third example, uh, is uh, smart TVs. Um, uh, smart TVs are um, doing a lot of great things, um, <coughs> but there have been recently some stories that made the news. Uh, for example, there was a company called Samba, T uh, Samba TV that they used the automatic con uh, content recognition to um, uh, to track what you are watching on your on your screen and save you ads. And not only that, but also detect what other devices when in your home that use the same network and they track those and serve ads to those devices as well. So in that particular case, that's interesting because actually Samba uh, did what they were supposed to. They had the privacy policy that was very obscure though for anybody to figure out. Uh, they did disclose it. You had to say okay to install, uh, to, to set up your smart TV. Uh, so technically they uh, did nothing wrong and actually had even some awards about how open and, and privacy protecting they, they were. Um, the thing is that Smart TV is not operating under the same principles as cable companies, so they are, uh, they are um, uh, regulated by FTC that um, um, as long as you follow the notice and consent and have a privacy policy, they, they were okay technically. So what is, what is the right law there? Like where should the Smart TV, uh, um, what should be the, the, the rules regulate the Smart TV? So I will stop here and uh, save more comments for the discussion. But these were three examples <coughs> where I think uh, the, uh, law could could play a great um, a, gr a great uh, role. Thank you. Thanks, Athena. And last but certainly not least, uh, April Sather. Uh, April is our first CPRI fellow. Don't be fooled by the title. She actually runs the place, um, and that's good because in some ways she's more qualified than I am. Uh, principally that she was a former Chief Information Security Officer herself uh, at Pacific Blue Cross. She's also, uh, I think, proud alumna of the Mirage School of Business here at UCI. Uh, she's got a rack of certifications in cybersecurity, and uh, most importantly to me, as I indicated earlier, uh, April is the woman without whom this event could not have happened. So let's welcome April. Thank you, Brian. So I think one of the things that all of our panelists share is the sense of really there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at this from a business perspective, uh, the idea of managing this risk, this very real risk of IoT-driven uh, privacy uh, issues and concerns, there's an accountability that consumers <coughs> expect. So while the lawyers are figuring things out, uh, on the business side, we need to be moving forward uh, and preparing ourselves for whatever shape these regulations may take. Um, one of the lesser known principles of risk management is around um, value creation, that good risk management actually creates value. And in general, when you are investing in doing the right thing, such as data privacy, that investment should uh, be justified in terms of people uh, valuing what you're protecting. And until now, well, let's say until January 1st, 2020, uh, the value of privacy wasn't really up there uh, in terms of the priorities of 
um, economics and what's really being uh, driven right now by consumers is a complete <coughs> tidal uh, shift and change in the value that people place on their personal information. So whether you're an app developer, whether you're an organization uh, with IoT devices in your environment, I'm going to share 10 questions to consider and to ponder when you go back to your organizations of ways right now that you can start preparing for whatever these new regulations look like. So um, first, uh, how many in this room uh, worked on GDPR in their organizations at any level to comply with GDPR? And that is uh, those very few organizations are already long, long, uh, far ahead, and they kind of have a sense of what's, uh, what I'm about to share. <coughs> the value of mapping the data in your environment, knowing what data you have. Um, a lot of the IoT devices are capturing things you would not be, you'd be very surprised at. And not only are they capturing it, uh, they're storing it in, in an ecosystem that you are likely not fully uh, aware of, um, using unencrypted pathways. Uh, there are uh, a very, very few expiration dates on the data that's being collected by IoT environments. So when you go back to your environment, <laughs> number one, create an inventory. What IoT devices do you have? You might be very, very surprised. Who has access to that data? How long are you keeping it and why? Do you even need to collect it in the first place? And I think the principle of data minimization and really collecting the absolute minimum for your business purpose is going to pay off in spades later on. For every piece of data you collect, it has a life cycle. And the cost of keeping that data, protecting that data, can grow exponentially. And with IoT, uh, you're at a whole new level uh, of expense there. Uh, once the regulation comes into force, you, know, you having a data map and a sense of what the data is protecting is going to put you in a much better place to not only show regulators that you're taking those right steps to comply, uh, but that you actually have a track record in, in succeeding. So uh, we have a lot of great uh, panelists today, a lot of things to discuss. I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to cut mine a bit short today, but I'm happy to answer questions out in the patio. Thanks, April. Okay, so we uh, have lunch coming, as I mentioned. We also have a lot of great uh, descriptions of some of the research work that we're doing here, and I think we'll have some demonstrations. Those can be inside or outside the demos? Outside. The demo outside? outside. Okay. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I, I do want to engage our panelists in a little bit of a discussion, uh, and I want to save enough time for a few questions from you all. Um, but to me, and I'll just give you guys fair notice, you all gave me questions, I'm not using them uh, for this question. Um, everyone has sort of touched on the fact that in the United States, unlike in Europe, our, uh, our laws and regulations around privacy and security are very balkanized. They're not general, they're by, uh, they're by economic sector. So if you're a healthcare company, you're probably covered. If you're a publicly traded company, you're probably covered, but all the regimes are different. And having done privacy and cybersecurity law now for 15 years, one of the most constant complaints I get from especially larger corporate clients is we, we really don't, we can't comply with 75 different laws at the same time. And even though most companies will tell you I don't want to be regulated, they'll also say if I'm going to be regulated, I don't want to have to comply with 75 laws, I want to comply with one law. So I would just ask uh, each of us to kind of go down the row here and um, Talk about what you think is the likelihood, as Scott raised, that the, the Congress in some reasonable period of time actually will pass a federal privacy law that preempts these other laws, and uh, what, what key things is that likely to contain, and then uh, get everyone's perspective on the likelihood and, and what it should contain. Scott, and then, yeah, we're going to have to pass that mic around. If you donate to CPRI, we'll have two mics next year. <laughs> Um, okay, so two things have lit a fire under Congress. One, all the data breaches. Second, um, Cambridge Analytica. Well, that is another data breach. So, and the other one's now the California law. Right, so I think there's all the incentive in the world for them to do something. Um, whereas previously it's been done sector specific, I think the push here is to do something broad because GDPR was broad, what California did was broad. That's not to say that at some point there won't be a reason to do something more specific for sectors where you don't have much competition and much choice. 
that deserve special rules. So I'm not endorsing that something non-sector specific is the solution for everything, but it would set a baseline. So what are they going to argue about? Um, they're going to argue about the scope of information. So think of it as your personal information is the combination of some identifier and some activity you've had. They're going to argue over what kind of identifiers and what kind of activity. Is it just your name? Is it also your IP address? Does your activity include where you go on the internet? Does it include your location? Um, they're going to argue about why privacy policies don't work and whether they can be improved or whether it's hopeless. So the good news is we're now beginning to see not just those god-awfully long privacy policies. Mm -hmm. Some companies are creating a second, really user-friendly version. Well, gee, that's interesting. Some of them don't just tell you you have the right to do something, go figure out where else to do it, where you can do it. Some of them give you a link. Well, that's interesting. What can we do with that? Um, we're definitely going to see them argue over consent, choice, opt-in, <laughs> opt-out, or no choice, take it or leave it. Um, we're going to definitely see arguments over de-identification or anonymization. Um, all of that, incredibly hard to predict. If anything comes out, given that Congress in recent years isn't exactly known for doing things bipartisan, and this one's going to have to be bipartisan. They're going to need 60 votes in the Senate. So there's incentive on both sides of the aisle to do something. There's a lot of latitude on where they end, where they end up. Okay, so over and under, Scott, uh, do we get the law by the next election or not? No. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, Athena, talk about that, but also, um, you know, many of these privacy regimes are written and tailored towards personal information stored in electronic devices. But as we've touched on, uh, IoT devices may have a privacy component, they may have lots of other security components too. So. In addition to making your prediction, um, how do you see privacy and IoT devices as different than in other domains? Um, yes, so with respect to the first question, um, Scott knows this, <laughs> can predict this better than me, but my guess is since GDPR is adopted and many manufacturers and companies need to comply with that anyway, that would be the part that will help to normalize other things. So I would wait to see a lot of mirroring of GDPR because if a company needs to comply with something, might as well comply with the most strict one. Um, so, in terms of uh, what should be there, I think you covered it. Um, with respect to what is different for IoT, with respect to um, to mobile, um, they are di simpler devices, so they don't have uh, um, the hardware and software capabilities that uh, phones or computers have to enforce uh, privacy. Uh, so come, uh, we have to come back with simpler uh, solutions. Um, and it's also not easy to define what is privacy for IoT devices. As a, uh, for a single device, it's my identifiers. It's uh, my identity is well defined. But for IoT in an ambient space, it's not even clear what, uh, <coughs> what, uh, how privacy should be defined. Um, and. Again, the other thing I want to mention that you already covered is that for IoT, IoT the law is already segmented. It falls in many different sectors, so um, that's why you're asking. So you, you're, predict, you're, gonna, you're going with Scott's prediction there won't be a law before the next election? That, that I don't know. Okay. I'm not sure there'll be any law passed inside <laughs> the next election on any subject. But Jack, what are your thoughts? And, um, you know, if it, now that the uh, California has passed this very bare-bones IoT security law, Attorney General is going to have to come up with regulation for that after the CCPA. Um, what one or two recommendations would you make to companies that um, build, design and build Internet of Things products? Well, um, do I get to answer the first yeah, question? Yeah, I said, after you answer that question. You know, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think um, I agree with Scott and Athena's his comments. I think they're really, uh, really prescient and, and hit, hit what the key issues are going to be. One other dynamic is that if, if, once the CCPA goes into effect, mm -hmm. if it still has teeth that force the big, you know, the t big five to change their behavior in fundamental ways, that could actually spur Congress to enact a rule that preempts the 
the California rule, right? So federal, the federal legislation that overlaps with state legislation, the federal legislation, uh, and I hate to use this word, trumps the state <laughs> legislation. Um, and so it overrides. Let's, let's just go with overrides that legislation. But um, so you could actually see a, a backlash. You know, Facebook could go to Congress and say, hey, you have to help us here. Get, get us something that's super friendly. Uh, I'm not hopeful that anything will get passed at all by 20, tw fall of 2020. Um, I'm also, I mean, although even a 30% chance would be way higher than it was a few, even a few years ago. Um, but I would also say that uh, there's even less a chance that it would be a truly consumer friendly uh, project, uh, uh, legislation. I think that if, it, if, it, uh, if we get any legislation that does more than endorse what um, what the big the big companies want to do, it would probably there would have to be a change of power in in the Senate and in the uh, <coughs> White House before that could happen. And even there, you know, I mean Chuck Schumer's daughter works for Facebook, um, and so he doesn't even uh, really perceive a problem with um, with what's going on Facebook. So you know, that's a uh, um, um, from a consumer advocacy standpoint, not super high hopes. Or Washington, but we'll see because consumer privacy is very powerful. To answer your question about recommendations, you know, uh, here at UCI and elsewhere, people have been talking for years about privacy by design, right? The idea that you know you don't uh, take take. Does anyone remember Google Buzz? What? Google Buzz was a was Google's attempt. Uh, it was actually nine years ago. Google's Google's decided they wanted to try to, you know, get do a social network that would beat Facebook. So they created this product called Google Buzz. And uh, people woke up in the morning and they found out, hey, you've been subscribed to Google Buzz and some of your Gmail follower, some of your Gmail people that you email with, you're now following them and they're now following you. So it's kind of a cross between Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, you had journalists who had their confidential sources they were gmailing with now publicly uh, visible as their followers and so people reporting in places like Syria and Yemen um, got in some trouble another person woke up and she was a survivor of domestic abuse and her current boyfriend and her abuser were uh, they're her followers so Google quickly uh, this is part of a consent decree with the FTC that later resulted Google um, um, what what actually happened was that the product people came up with this, and the, and the internal process of Google was that at the very end they had a lawyer check a box: has this been, has this, does this comply with all privacy rules or not? And uh, at that point, there was too much momentum, and that poor lawyer, whoever he or she was, got steamrolled. Right? That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is that you tell, you know, you don't just give the specs to your engineers. You also say, what are the privacy values that we want? Do we want to have uh, consent for all this. Do we want to have uh, opt out and so on? And so privacy by design and thinking about these at the beginning. Someone said earlier that it, it's extremely hard to retrofit your devices to be secure. Just extremely difficult. And much more expensive. And much more expensive. And of course by that time you got a bunch of other problems dealing with okay well what do we do with our storage and are we actually complying with the law even if it's secure? Right? So I think another one is the data minimization principle. Right? Uh, use what you need um, and have a clear definition of, of what you need and how, and how you need it. And I think that you know, in terms of consent, there have been studies now for over a decade that shows that people will click the box, they won't read the privacy policy, and they won't really read shortened notices either. Right? And so the, better, the shorter notices are better, people are paying more attention because they've been primed by news stories and, and other things and other and their own experiences of identity theft and so on to be thinking about these issues. But generally we can assume they won't read. What I think would be good would be a set of terms that everybody could understand, like a like what they call uh, like if you ever uh, take a piece of uh, see it on here. If you ever you know anything you buy at the grocery store it has a box. It'll tell you the calories, the ingredients, percentage daily recommended, uh, parts of various things and over time, consumers know how to read those and how to evaluate, okay, protein versus carbs or whatever. And you could do the same with privacy policy. Are you able to opt out and still use the service? Yes. Are you sharing it with people in an anonymized way? Yes or no. Can you opt out? Yes or no? And so on. And have something very simple that would be in graphical format or something like that. Maybe that would work. 
uh, but, uh, but the consent issue is a tough one, right? So a lot of commentators think that what would be better than, than, than actually, you know, giving consumers consent because it's too complex and, it's not, and there's, there's not really choice for the consumers is to do what the CCPA and the GDPR are now doing, which is to say, no, consumers can opt out and we, we as a polity are going to make that decision for the consumers and force the companies to sort of default to certain uh, to certain arrangements. Yeah, speaking of uh, consent and Google, another really weird day was the day when tens of thousands of Google subscribers woke up one morning and they were actually wearing the Google glasses. That was crazy that day. It was a tough room. Um, uh, I just want to add one thing on the kind of political forecasting element of this. I think We'll hear from April, see if she wants to be the dissenter, but you've heard a lot of skepticism of, of something like this actually getting done uh, in the next couple of years. It's actually even harder than we made it sound, because under our Constitution, although federal law can preempt a state law, can overrule it completely in certain most areas, typically if the state law gives an individual more rights than the federal law, those parts of the state law will still stand unless the Congress uses very specific, very strong language stating we intend to overrule every other law that's like this. And that is even a much tougher legislative hurdle to get that language in. Believe me, I was a CIA lawyer for a long time. We always tried to get that in, and it's not easy. Um, the other element of this, though, is you know of the 310 Democratic candidates for president, um, a very significant percentage of them uh, are in some way, shape, or form either tied to or affected by or have a legacy related to technology and consumer issues, the most obvious being uh, your Senator Kamala Harris. I don't say that because I don't count her as my senator as a Californian. I count that because I've moved to Washington, so I'm not making any statement about her. But many of the candidates have these issues, you know, obviously Facebook is, is in her state, Google is in her state, at least significant part. So I think what we might see, even if we don't see a legal change, is these issues being a lot more front and center in the debates than they typically would be. But who knows, predicting the future uh, you know, is a no-win situation. But we're going to still ask April to do it. And also, April, um, since you're, I believe, the only person on our panel uh, who's been uh, both a practitioner uh, who has to comply with these laws and also an academic who studies these laws, um, should there be uh, overarching federal law? And will there be? I'm a bit cynical. Uh, I have to say that I do not see any real uh, law coming into place in the next perhaps 18, 24 months. However, at a sector level, health care, financial services, when you look at the traditionally strong uh, regulation. Uh, it's no one's favorite, but at the end of the day, it has really produced some incredible strides and maturity uh, in privacy and security. Uh, the average hospital bed has between 10 and 15 sensors uh, connected to it. And when we think about the, the risks around sensors that are uh, taking us all back to our keynote uh, this morning from Kevin Fu, we need to take this very, very seriously. So. Um, some of the active legislation I've been reading about is around the flying IoT uh, with the drones and some of the surveillance that's going on out there. And I really think that because it's so big, that there's a better, much higher probability that some of these sector-specific, product-specific, application and use case-specific uh, laws will see the light of day. Uh, <laughs> when you look at surveillance, you look at drones and what that takes away in terms of privacy, uh, you know, people are not going to be uh, accepting that as something that is going to continue. And, and I think it really comes down to outrage. And how much does it bother the consumer? They're giving things up voluntarily through their social media, and perhaps when they click on these privacy policies. But it's all about the context. Uh, and it is very, very difficult to give away uh, something when you're not necessarily conscious of what the different applications might be of the data that you are um, you're giving away. And with IoT, people literally are they're just blissfully unaware, but not for long. So uh, I think things will be happening, but on a sector-specific basis. Yeah, that, that drone uh, category is a really good example. I, I think, at least I would have predicted nine years ago that by now we'd be 
20 drones flying around out there. Amazon would be delivering them to our houses with drones. The paparazzi would be using them all over the place. And you don't see them. I, I, I probably see one a month or something. And I think a lot of that's be just because individuals got outraged by it. And even though there's not a you know, uniform law that regulates drones in every jurisdiction, the leaders and the companies sort of have this sense that people are going to be pissed. And so they're, they're holding back a little bit, I think, on, on uh, some of the moves that they might have made in that area. I want to definitely leave time for some questions from the group. Does anybody have any other comments you want to throw off before we go to the questions? Okay, well, thanks for, oh, yes, sir. Oh. Well, okay, um, thank you. B, yes. Um, so my name is David. Uh, we manufacture privacy shades, so this is really interesting to me. Um, but I've been reading You mean shades, shades, or you mean shades? Yeah, like these things, for example, but better. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, have tech. I don't have any, like, information yet. Um, but I was, re I was trying to study the, uh, the stuff as much as I could, and it seems like they do make a uh, separation between publicly available data and not publicly available data as far as, like, your liability bills. But with these massive hacks, like, I think Experian, was it, or Equifax? Equifax, yeah. So much stuff is theoretically out there. Isn't there plausible deniability that any uh, hack is or is not my fault? It's, you know, torrent that's already out there. Yeah, I, I think part of the reason, we, we talked earlier today, Equifax just announced that it, that, that, okay. that hack has cost them $1.4 billion. But it hasn't put them out of business like a lot of people thought it would. And, and part of the reason why these lawsuits typically have not succeeded so far is just what you said. It's very difficult to prove that any dam first of all, it's hard to prove damage in the first place. And secondly, it's very hard to prove that the damage came from the Equifax hack instead of the Target hack instead of the Yahoo hack. Um, and that's something that I think is going to develop even without any kind of new law being passed to the extent that we get better, technology gets better about being able to pinpoint where your damages came from, then there will be more legal liability just because these court suits will be <coughs> more successful. Does anybody have anything to add on that, Scott? Yeah, so the um, California law as it stands actually has a very narrow definition of public records. So it's essentially governmental records. Although one of the bills that's hanging out this year, we'll see what happens to it, would broaden it. And the question is how far will it broaden? Social security numbers are government records, and I think those got stolen. <coughs> well, I think we're actually talking about two different things at the same time. The, uh, a social security number is a governmental record, right? But it's also, you, you give it voluntarily or not to dozens and dozens of agencies. So just because it's a public record does not mean that if, if it gets compromised, the company that had to compromise doesn't have liability. I don't know how many more negatives I could put in the same sentence, but uh, it, 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 it's not really so important, I don't think, anyway, unless somebody disagrees with me, whether or not the original record is a government record. The question is, did you have legal responsibility to protect it? And just because something is findable through another source legally doesn't get you off the hook. The problem is proving that it came from one source instead of the other. Athena? Yeah, and one fun fact about the first example I mentioned in the eye attack. So they made it publicly, uh, they made the tool publicly available, and then it was not clear who was the attacker. And that's a classic technique from this type of tools to deny um, liability. Right, sir. So there's laws that are like, you know, what happened in the past? Like, so much information is already on publicly available on the web. You know, for 10 years. <coughs> In theory, if you could, if you could prove, <laughs> my opinion is, having done these cases, if 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 you had a, a major economic loss, or even a minor economic loss that you could prove came from your Yahoo credentials that were hacked, even though it was six or seven years ago, you Yahoo, well now Verizon, could theoretically be responsible that, for that. But again, the problem is how how you're ever going to prove that in most of these cases, man. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned Kelia. That was actually a, an anti-privacy law that required every phone provider to put a back door in their product so that the government could listen in on us if they want to. So with, with a warrant. With the, well, the, the fact is, in 
back door is there. Anybody can get in. And there was a story in uh, Greece where the uh, crooks actually used that. So the idea is we're kind of speaking, will the government do something about privacy? But it looks like their interest uh, is in anti-privacy and having more information about us. So expecting from them to protect our privacy where they're interested in the opposite, doesn't it sound unrealistic? Well, I have a strong view about that, but I'll defer to my panelists. Well, I think you can you can distinguish between saying we're going to prevent the Googles or the Facebooks or whatever you know companies is to come from misusing data versus giving government access for lawful uses, right? So way back in 2010, uh, and again in 20 uh, in 2014, uh, my clinic filed comments with the Federal Communications Commission about net neutrality because. The rules that they promulgated and, and, and eventually went into effect uh, said, yeah, you have to have net neutrality, but only for lawful uses. Um, for, for, for not, you can do anything you want if it's not a lawful use. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can look at every packet that goes through and see what it says and decide whether to throw it out or not. And that's just one example, right? And so every privacy policy says, well, we're not going to do anything with your with your data, except that we, we, we may do it and it'll just say we're going to share it with our partners, whatever that means, but leaving that aside. We're not going to do anything with your data, but if we get a subpoena or, or whatever, then we can do it, right? So there are protections there that um, give the government access and that also restrict uses by private actors, right? So after the warrantless surveillance uh, program was revealed in 2006, that the NSA had put together under the Bush administration, uh, several civil liberties groups sued uh, AT&T and said, you broke the Electronic Communications Act pretty, pretty blatantly when you did this without a warrant. You're supposed to have a warrant to intercept communications. The law is very clear. The government came back and said, that may be the case, but state secrets. And the state secret doctrine says that we have national security related secrets and you can't get that information, and that eventually killed the case. Uh, so, you know, I think you can make that distinction, and then the question is, you know, how well do you trust the government? But the, I, I see those as two separate fronts, if you're going to approach it from a consumer perspective, as two separate fronts. And even from an from a industry perspective, uh, to the extent that that's not a consumer per, uh, perspective, you know, you could say the same thing. So, our hands are going to be tied, but that's distinct from what the government's going to be required to do. So that's sort of the framework I would take. But I, but I think Brian probably has some ideas about this since he was in government. Um, well, dealing how much time do you have? Um, the, the one say, thing I would say, because we're almost out of time, I know there's at least one more question, is there is a significant amount of overlap between these two issues. That is, how much the government can get through lawful process like a warrant and how much we're going to let private companies hold, right? Because Facebook and Google are massive targets for the government to go get warrants or get subpoenas and get the information. So people who say, very few people say this anymore, but people who say, I'm much more comfortable with Facebook having my information than the government are making a huge mistake because all the government has to do is get the correct order and they're going to get that information. Sir. All right. Um, first of all, thank you. It's a fantastic uh, event. Um, a couple of you mentioned the term of uh, anonymization or de-identification. Um, just like an example, you know, when you have these insurance companies on TV say, we'll give you an anonymous quote. Well, underwrite your vehicle, you need your vehicle, your age, your gender, and your zip code, right? Well, in the United States, the overlap of people in there is less than like, you know, 10,000 or something out of 170 million drivers. So, Anonymization in and of itself is, you know, is it actually possible? Is it realistic? And then how does that, uh, you know, um, combine with the data expiration or shelf life? You know, it's like people may years later go, hey, look, we just draw these Venn diagrams and we're picking out individuals from theoretically anonymized data. How do you, uh, how do you see that? Yeah. Let me yeah. start on this. I think you answered your question. So, no, that's well understood that uh, PI, uh, anonymization and PAIs are not, are not enough. Uh, so what is a PAI? It's your name, it's your security, it's your gender. It's, uh, so there are different pieces of information. Where do you draw the line of what is uh, identifying information and 
when it's not. And there are many studies that have showed that although these obvious identifiers are anonymized, there are a combination of the remaining attributes. Yeah, and particularly there's a famous study about from medical records. Um, I forget it was, it was a gender uh, year of birth. Yeah. and zip code, that they were enough to identify 70% uh, of the database in a, in, a, in a medical hospital. So correlating that to the, so yeah, there's not a good technical definition of that, and there's no good um, way to answer what is uh, identifying information and what is not. So that, that on its own is necessary, but it's definitely not sufficient. Okay. Especially when you correlate it <coughs> with uh, uh, data sets outside the one you're trying to anonymize. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and under the health care law, the HIPAA, there actually are requirements that you do not have to meet if you can show that the data is truly anonymized. And there are actually people who have made it their profession to go in and inspect a health care company and certify that it can't be, usually the test is, cannot be re-identified with reasonable effort. Um, some people think those are professionals, and some people think they're snake oil salesmen. Uh, uh, they're out there, Scott. Effort. It depends yeah, so on what you're after, right? I, mean, I think this is critically important. Um, a lot of the literature on this comes from fields other than the internet. And if you have just 20 blanks on a medical form, it's a whole different um, issue than if you have all of this rich data flowing through your internet traffic. And so I think it's critically important that personal information include cases where it's not your name or your phone number or your address, but it's your IP address combined with what you did on the internet. And I think it's critically important that de-identified does not include individual data records about me with just some information asked. That should not qualify for any exception. Anybody else? Just on this question, then we gotta, we got to wrap it up. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for staying half a day. Uh, thanks to our panelists.